So welcome everyone. And for those of you that are new, don't worry, you'll catch up and um, we'll make it a collaborative effort. So we'll take a minute and just set our motivation. Roll up and cheer, Sange Drupa Show. Sange Churon Sogi Churamla. John to Padu Dani Gapsuchi. Dagi Churn Yangi Pesonamgi. Roll up and cheer, Sange Drupa Show. Sange Churon Sogi Churamla. John to Padu Dani Gapsuchi. Dagi chun yan ki pe sonam ki roll up and cheer sangi drupa sho. And just letting the motivation refresh and revive and connect to your heart. So here we go. Love versus attachment. Attachment's relationship to anger. All the trouble that happens in our life um, it really is boiling down to some sort of version of attachment. You know, a lot of our teachers will say, of course, samsara began, of course, there's no beginning, but began with ignorance, but it's perpetuated by attachment. Yeah, so it's like, if we... Um, if we could really get on top of our attachment and really understand it from its depths, samsara would just fall apart, would just fall apart. And even if we brought awareness of the distinction between attachment and love into our daily life, our quality of life would improve immediately, even before we have any kind of realization. Just an awareness to keep us from getting hooked or to help us unhook when the hooks begin, our quality of life would just go straight up. Our relationships would already improve. Our communication would already improve. And we already know that, which is why we're all here, I think. But it's, it's this question of how do you remember on purpose what you already know? You know, how do you bring to the forefront of your mind the wisdom that you've touched any number of times throughout your life that says love is excellent, attachment is really evil in a way. It steals the power of love. It co-ops the behaviors of love and it distorts them. And, you know, you've, you've had these moments in your life where you've felt that viscerally and the disappointments and the rage and the betrayal and the you know, kind of poignant, sad melancholy and the isolation and the loneliness, all of which came from attachment. All of those feelings come from attachment. And sometimes in a crisis moment, you see it clearly and you think, I will never do that again. And then you do, <laughs> right? So this is our state of affairs. This is how we are. and. It's the human condition. And I think if we just start from that basis of we're all in the same boat, it just looks different person to person, but everyone has their version of attachment, addictive behaviors, craving, grasping, everyone does. And so from the beginning, let's try and talk about this without shame and without over-identification because if we can't kind of shake off what other, whatever kind of remnants of our previous belief systems or the cultural influence that has so much guilt and shame and weirdness around attachment, then it becomes really painful to talk about. But if we remember the Buddhist mindset of detached, not disengaged, taking responsibility, but not attributing fault, if we remember that mindset, then we can talk about it really freely and really um, candidly without the kind of shame trigger. So, um, so let's try and do that. And what I'll do is a bit of just kind of classic, let's run down and make sure we understand what we're talking about, definitions, and then we'll have some discussion and then we'll do meditation. And we'll just kind of cycle through that pattern throughout the day of presentation, discussion, meditation. And we'll talk a lot about 
catching your own version of attachment so that it's a very direct teaching for your specific life. Because for one person, attachment looks like, you know, hungry, craving, busy, you know, and for some people, it looks like paralysis of being overwhelmed and stuck and stagnant, you know, so it can look totally different, even though it's the same disturbing emotion. So we want to really unpack what is it for you as an individual, even if you don't share that with the group that you wake up your self awareness of it so that it's even clearer than it was before. So we'll start with just a little PowerPoint just to get on the same page. And so um, here we go. Okay, so we have here um, dictionary definitions. Okay, and it's important to start with the dictionary definitions because these are already words that we grew up with. And when I say dictionary definitions, I'm not talking about the psychological understanding. I'm talking about just raw colloquial English. So in English, when we say love, we're talking about an intense feeling of deep affection. And it often has the connotation of deep romantic or sexual attachment, or like love personified in the figure of Cupid, or maybe even, or even God sometimes. Um, um, or when we say love, we're talking about great interest or pleasure in a person, activity, or object. So when we say love, we sometimes mean liking, we sometimes mean wanting, we sometimes mean connection, we sometimes mean um, wanting to benefit, but it all gets kind of wrapped up and tangled in our everyday explanation of love. And that is not the Buddhist definition. We need to name it first though, so we remember that we have that conditioning. So then attachment, just colloquially, is affection, fondness, sympathy for someone or something. It can mean an affectionate relationship between two people. And so in this context, it sounds like a good thing. You know, we're brought up to believe that it's a, a really disastrous thing if you can't form attachments. You know, these are words that we hear. So when you're looking at these two, just for a moment, reflect on before you met Buddhism or before Buddhism was a huge part of your life, how did you frame those two words? Were they almost synonyms? You know, were they things that you had a religious connotation with or a spiritual connotation with or a psychological connotation with? Just try and remember what your initial association with these words were. Because even if it's different now, there's still kind of a carryover. So just kind of have a look for a sec. And would you add anything to that colloquial definition of love and attachment? Would there be anything that, that seems kind of missing there that you've also associated with? If someone says, um, I'm in love, what does that mean? in the world, not in Buddhism, just kind of conversationally, what, what immediately does it evoke? Romantic love. Yeah, romantic love. Yep. And then what is romantic love? It seems like it's like this elevated thing. But what is it? I mean, is there kind of a connotation of possessiveness that we label loyalty? Yeah, this is my ah. person, <laughs> right? This one is mine. <laughs> um, and that means all sorts of things that are both positive and negative, right? So if this person is my person, then I have loyalty to them. And there's these big, you know, bold heading titles and signposts above our relationship. And what is the positive side of that? And what is the negative side of that when you've decided this one is mine? Or it could be this child is mine, you know, or this friend, they're mine. The possessiveness that we have in the world when we say, I have love for this person or I'm in love with this person. And just kind of sit with what's the benefit of that? Because there is a social benefit of that sometimes. And then what's the disadvantage of that? I think uh, the benefit is the feeling that you connected to some somebody in a very special way, very close way. 
The problem is what happens when you don't have it. When the child or the person just, you know, something happened. So uh, it's like closeness. almost like, yeah. Yeah, closeness. This is what we want, isn't it? We want connection and closeness. And we sort of decide that there's a few relationships that get to have that, you know? Like I will allow deep closeness with this, this, and this person, family, you know, partner, maybe some close friends, then, then there's closeness allowed. And why do we want closeness in the first place? You know, what does it do for us to feel close? These might seem like very obvious kind of rhetorical questions, but it's, it's an invitation to examine why do we even want closeness? Security. Security, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, safe. Yeah, yeah. We feel safe. We feel uh, happy. We feel loved. <laughs> safe we, from we what? We don't feel alone. <laughs> yeah, you don't feel alone. Definitely right. you don't feel alone. It's great questions. And also I think about there's the implication of trust and mm. kind of undying, you know, permanent. Uh, there's an implication of permanence, even though not... <laughs> You yeah, we know better, it. but we don't know better. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is some sort of connotation that a close agreement equates to safety and security, and I won't be alone now. And right. that's kind of true, isn't it? It's kind of true, but not as true as we're kind of told to believe or we assume we believe. Do you, do you agree? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, more. Yeah, unpack it more. I think there's also a sense of, of validation mm. when you're in a relationship, you know, seeking <laughs> seeking an attachment or a relationship with someone to to get over your own insecurities, to feel validated, to feel less alone, you know, more able to deal with the day by day because you have a partner in crime. And it takes, you know, I feel like it takes the burden, uh, a certain amount of a burden off of yourself and your own personal responsibility, because now you've got this person, you know, if you're in a, in a, you know, a marriage or a couple sort of relationship, uh, you know, sharing the burden of day to day life. And, and also on the same hand, you have someone to blame. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's my way, right. You were supposed to support me and you didn't. And that's why I'm grumpy. It has nothing to do with my own emotional development. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's another thing that I'm thinking of. I think that when we're in love with someone, we tend to exaggerate his good qualities, for instance. You know, we, it, it, there are stages, but at least at the beginning, you know, you exaggerate. You sure. see only the wonderful things and, you know, and it's a problem because... Normally, afterwards, you're looking for the faults in the same person. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But like, an, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like initially there is that feeling that if you are seen and accepted, there is relief and happiness. These are associations we just want to kind of challenge very gently and check in with. Because, of course, being seen and validated is something that a human being really does crave. But why do we crave it? Why do we think we need it? What does it do for us? And why can't we do that for ourselves? You know, these are just kind of the, the things to explore without any edge of judgment or kind of self condemnation. You know, we want to have these questions with ourselves in a really objective, spacious way that says, why do I need to be seen and having been seen then be accepted and validated? Why do I need that for happiness? What, what, what is, why is that an ingredient? Is it a real ingredient or is it a habitual ingredient? Habitual. You, know, you don't have, you know, and you don't have to like come to a conclusion, but just kind of like, yeah, why do I think that? I think I wanted to just say, I think conventionally, there is also this assumption that, you know, if you're not married by a certain age or you don't have somebody by someone, there's something wrong with you. You know, yeah. you're weird and you just, especially in cultures where, you know, you have their expectations that by a certain age, you're married, by a certain age, you have kids. And 
if you don't follow that, they're like, what's wrong with you? And what's wrong with your family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all this kind of societal pressure. And certainly when I've visited Israel, I've had very kind people come up to me and say, you're still young, but you better get on it quickly. You know, I, this whole nun thing, are you done yet? You know, you're like, your eggs are dying. Like make some, you know, come on. <laughs> you know, and they're sort of trying to be reassuring. Like, you're still okay. You could, you could find someone, surely. <laughs> and I'm like... I'm, I'm, I'm good, <laughs> but thank you. You know, but there is that kind of interesting pressure of um, this is something that society says is necessary. And then if I go outside of that, that means that somehow I won't be accepted by also society, never mind the lack of partner, meaning lack of acceptance, societal acceptance will then be less. Um, you know, this is very obvious to us. These are conversations we have a lot, I'm sure, um, but we want to just challenge it as an individual what is the essence of closeness and connection that is so satisfying and necessary? Um, I, for me, I think there, there's a, a feeling of being able to let go of defending myself or protecting myself. It's like there's the wall, it, it takes some effort. I think even before I started studying this, um, I realize that there's some effort involved in just keeping up that wall. And there's a relief, somebody used the word relief before, there's a relief in letting go of that. And that, okay, I feel safe with this person. Yeah, there, there's no need to protect your identity or defend your identity or, you know, have that sense of- Yes, um, right, yeah. exactly. You yeah. can let your hair down. Exactly. <laughs> you can let your gut out. You can <laughs> sit in a floppy way and you will still be accepted and loved. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it can also be an, an excuse to start uh, to not have to examine yourself. If you're being validated from an outside source, then even though you know you have your own sort of issues, whatever they may be, by having someone else accept you as you are, you don't have to um, slay those dragons or work through those problems or, you know, a lot of relationships just stagnate and both partners stagnate. There's no evolution and, and you're kind of off the hook, you know, in terms of personal growth or introspection or, you know, just looking, it, it, being in love with someone gets you to focus your attention on someone else instead of yourself. You can yeah, give pros and cons. <laughs> pros and cons to that. Yeah. To that person, and, and and you know whether you feel like a martyr or not, you know by giving, 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 you're not required to examine yourself because what you're yeah. doing is so good and important, and you're taking care of someone else, and that's your righteous job, and yeah 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 i think i think we all can um remember times of that and um yeah it's it's a it's a fascinating thing to explore and and i'm glad that we are i i think that we have to keep coming back to our old assumptions and then just kind of bringing in the buddhist wisdom and just kind of like poking our background assumptions with our Buddhist wisdom and kind of seeing where there's resistance and seeing where there's receptivity and, and just gradually kind of getting into all of that in a very experiential way, I think is going to be the most useful approach. So I'm glad that you guys are, are sharing openly. I think it'll really um, help the process. So then we shift, right? And we look at the kind of common Buddhist descriptions. And these aren't like the technical debate definitions. These are kind of commonly agreed upon colloquial descriptions of the Buddhist definition. Okay, so in the Buddhist path, we're talking about love as the sincere wish that others be happy and the feeling that their happiness is more important than our own and it's opposite in nature from attachment. And then attachment is that deluded mind that sees its object as attractive and sinks into and cannot separate from it and is one of the six principal delusions. So in all of our relationships, romantic relationships, familial relationships, friend relationships, what we're doing is 
realizing that there is love and attachment present both. And it's not that they are mixed, it's that they alternate. And that's the thing we want to unpack that is different than the way the world describes love and attachment. In the world, we might say, oh, I've got some mixed motivations and I've got some selfish motivations, but generally I love them and there's a little bit of selfishness mixed with it. When actually what happens is that you go back and forth between love and attachment and the behaviors of love and attachment can look the same. So how do you know the difference? And you sit with, okay, so how do I know the difference if what I'm feeling for this person is love or attachment? Because I know I want them to be happy and I know I want them to be free from suffering, but is there a longer sentence that says, so that they'll make me happy? And an assumption that they are the primary cause for your well being. You know, does it go too far? So attachment is kind of, it's got this quality that says, sure, I want everything good for them. Of course I do, of course I do. I'll do anything for you. I'll go to the ends of the earth for you. I'll change my job and my country for you. I'll leave everything behind for you, for you, for you, for you. And it sounds like love. It sounds sacrificial. It sounds just beautiful and glorious and romantic. And we forget that when you're in that daydream haze of I'd do anything and it's all kind of escalated like that, that there is a background assumption that says, because closeness to you is what I need for my happiness. And so I'll do anything to have closeness with you because closeness with you equals happiness. And it's not to say that closeness doesn't equal happiness, but we're mistaking a condition for a cause. And we're thinking that they are the cause of the happiness when in fact, they're just a condition. So this is what attachment does is that it will even take the words of love and then distort them. And attachment is objectifying people. It's making them into objects for our use. It's not seeing the humanity and the full picture and the spectrum of a person unrelated to how they are with us. And so when we alternate between love and attachment, we wanna kind of catch when our classic windows where we slip and what are the conditions that really allow for a slip. And this, what we're gonna unpack a little bit this, week, this today is to really look at why is it that my brain kind of goes into the distortion? So we'll come back here and just have a look and try and look now experientially. Okay, so love sees the good qualities or positive possibilities of a person as well as their suffering and the negative behaviors that flow, that may flow from it. And it doesn't attribute substantial causation to conditions. So when you love someone, you're seeing their positive qualities and you're also seeing their suffering and you're also acknowledging that negative behaviors might come from their suffering. And all of that does not negate your wishing them well. And all of that doesn't mean that is why you are happy with them. Yeah, so just experientially, love is like that. Attachment also sees the good qualities. It's not like attachment doesn't see the good. It says, sees that of a person, but also an object or a situation in isolation from the big picture. And it also exaggerates their impact on your personal happiness. So to say that it sees the good qualities in isolation means that you don't have to completely deny everything attachment says to you. You know, attachment might say, this person is a great communicator. This person is trustworthy. This person is kind to small children and animals. This person is whatever, whatever. And those are in fact things that they do and are generally speaking as a trend. You know, of course they have their slip ups and their inconsistencies, but those might genuinely be qualities that you can objectively obsess this person to have. What attachment does is says, and that is it. <laughs> that is who they are. 
it doesn't say, and they also are horrible in the morning and they also forget to fill up the car with gas and they also, you know, also, and they also, and they also. And they also are uncomfortable with my large emotions and will leave when I cry or, and they also, you know, so attachment is just taking the good and wrapping it up in this tidy package and saying, this is who they are and I need that. Instead of this is who they are and it's nice to be with that. Yeah, love is much more expansive and it's got a lot less pressure and tightness and need. Yeah, so, so just kind of like teasing it out in your mind, you know, kind of getting it into tidy categories, even though experientially in life, it's not so tidy. But if you can kind of start to do that intellectually, it's easier to bring that understanding into your daily life. Did you did you have some thoughts on it? I just, Venerable, may I ask you to clarify that last, um, at the bottom of the slide on love, about some st substantial causation and not condition? Yeah. So this is kind of referencing what we understand about karma. When we talk about karma, we talk about substantial causes and coactive conditions. And I think, you know, at least probably half of you are very familiar with that teaching and maybe I don't know about the other half. But when we say a substantial cause, we're talking about the karmic seed, which is what will give rise to the happiness. When we're talking about a coactive condition, we're talking about the conditions that make that seed sprout. If it were a literal seed, it would be like the water and the sunshine and the earth. But without the seed, it doesn't matter if you have water, sunshine and earth, you're not gonna get any sprout. So the substantial cause of your happiness is what? What's the substantial cause of your happiness, generally speaking? Thinking of other sentient beings, like, uh, yeah, right. Positive not having like self grasping, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Actions done with less self grasping, less self cherishing, more altruism, um, positive states of mind, positive actions of speech and body, are what plant karmic seeds for happiness on your mental continuum. Yeah, and, and so it's, it's so important to come back to karma because it's confusing in terms of the real life experience of it. You know, from a distance, karma makes a lot of sense. It's really straightforward. It seems really easy. It gets oversimplified in pop culture and it feels just kind of what goes around comes around. And we forget that it's an incredibly nuanced thing and that karma is an extremely hidden phenomena that is more difficult to realize than emptiness. But what we can realize in real time is that whatever we're experiencing right now is not about right now. What we're experiencing right now is the ripening result from the past, meeting with the present conditions. So you had your seed, your little seed for this experience that you're having in this moment. And that seed could have been created last lifetime or a hundred lifetimes ago, but it was from the past. And then the conditions of this moment, namely your current states of mind, your current thoughts, also the surroundings and the people around you, those are the things that water and germinate that into experience. So what happens with, when we're with someone we really care about is that we've made them a condition to water positive seeds and then we're happy with them. And then we think we're happy because of them. When in fact we could be happy because of many things <laughs> and they are a condition and it's not, you know, we're not 
disrespecting the fact that there's been a lot of work and care into making them a condition, but they're not the injector of your happiness. You know, it's not like you come in front of the person you love and then they force feed you happiness and that's how love works. Are you always happy with people that you love? You know, right? Like often that's the most difficult person, even though they're the one we care about the most, you know? Never mind people we don't like, we're just kind of indifferent and mildly irritated. But with the one we love, rage, sadness, angst, you know? And this is the really important thing to realize is that if you're happy, it's from your work in the past, your positive work in the past. And of course, your positive work in the past is a dependent arising. Many, many conditions came together for you to plant a positive karmic seed on your mental continuum. Many causes and conditions came together for the conditions around you right now. But to say, that one thing is why I feel this way is always an exaggeration, unless you're saying the one thing is my previous moment of mind germinating this karmic seed. And even that's a bit of an exaggeration because the karmic seed could hang out not having experience unless it's germinated. So uh, yeah, do you want to unpack anything about karma before we kind of move back to love and attachment? I don't want to leave it if there's bits you wanted a, to flesh I out. A quick question. Sure. What about, um, how do you explain karmically then chronic um, patterns in, in your life or like a chronic condition? That's what I've never quite understood because each moment is a separate moment and it arises and it abides and then it's gone. So... I've never really understood how you can apply what you've just said to like a chronic um, experience of suffering, whether physical, mental, or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's an important question. And um, it comes back to, for those of you that are Lam Rim people, it comes back to this idea that karma has many types of effects, one, one, and there's many types of karma you know, there's heavy and light, all different sizes of karma. So say you have a complete karma, which means, you know, you thought about doing it, you did it, you wanted to do it, there was an affliction present, you did do it, and you were like, yes, I did it. You know, so if, say, for example, mosquito lands on your arm, you say, I hate mosquitoes, I want to kill it. And then you do, and you go, ha ha, I got it. That's a complete karma right? That's a complete karma. Whereas if you see the mosquito and say, I want to kill it, but I'm not going to blow it off. You know, that's a much lighter karma. And it's not got that same power to, for example, throw an entire lifetime. So projecting karma is very much related to your physical body in this life. Your physical body in this life is a projected karma from the past. So that one karmic seed that projected this life has a much longer duration than a lot of the completing karmas that you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis in a moment-to-moment -moment way. Yeah, so throwing karma, the one that got ripened on your last deathbed, you know, the last thoughts as you die are the conditions that ripen the seed for your rebirth. So that's something that is thrown already. So it could be that you have the karma to live for a hundred years, but you also have the karma for um, some obstacle to living that full duration, which is why you might do lots of purification practices to you know, clear obstacles to living your full lifespan. But you can't add to that hundred years because this karma only had the power to go for a hundred years, for example. So very much use the seed analogy. The seed analogy is so useful with karma because you know that there are some plants that, you know, they sprout and they grow and they live for a few days and then they die. And then there's some things that sprout and grow and they're a tree that lasts for a thousand years. So, you know, different seeds have different potencies. So your physical body, you can navigate some of the conditions within your physical body and some of them you can't. And, you know, it's a very nuanced conversation, but it's like you couldn't force yourself to have a different color of eyes. 
you know, you might be able to, I don't know, eat differently and slightly adjust their shade. I don't know how these things work, but you know, like there's conditions that could influence it, but you can't like force your blue eyes to be brown, right? But if you have an illness, for example, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. That's something that I will have my whole life. It's a genetic disorder. It came with this body, but how much it affects me is very much related to my state of mind on any given day and which karmic seeds I'm ripening any given day. But it's a thing I'll have continuously until I die. So that's true of the physical body. That's also true in some ways of your mental experience, but there's a lot more wiggle room with your mental experience because the mental experience is not physical. You know, the mind is not the brain, it just uses the brain. So when you're looking at behaviors, now you're starting to talk about the karmic category of causally concordant behavioral results. You know, causally concordant behavioral results are probably our biggest work in this life to try and overcome habit patterns. So it could be that, for example, even when you tell the truth, people don't believe you. Say that's something that happens to you in this life, that even when you tell the truth, people don't believe you, you know that, okay, if people don't believe me, that means that in, in the past, I have been deceptive. I've been actively deceptive in the past, and now that is ripening now. And what you ask yourself is, do I have the causally concordant behavioral result also in an unacknowledged way, or do I just have this result similar to the cause? Right? So you're having results similar to the cause playing out, but are you having the behavioral result as well? The behavioral result is the habit to do it. So you look back and you think, as a child, was I a bit of a fibber? <laughs> Did I tell big exaggerated stories that weren't like obvious lies, but they were not really true? okay, they were lies. Okay, fine. You know, and then you think, okay, then as a teenager, okay, then as an adult, and you ask yourself, oh, actually, I had this thing happening where people didn't believe me. And also I was a big liar. <laughs> and I just didn't own it. And now as an adult, I've changed my habits, and I don't do that anymore, or I do it a lot less, but I'm still kind of wearing the past. And some of that is relationally based. I might have broken trust with people, but some of that might have nothing to do with my current relationships. They never knew I was a big fibber as a child. I've only been honest with them, and yet still they don't believe me. You know, so you're, you're kind of wearing out old karma, but because you've stopped the habit, you're not creating new karma of that type for your future. So you can just kind of be like, all right, every time I wear it well and don't react with anger and don't react with deception, I'm finishing that old speech karma. You know, and you can take some satisfaction from that. Um, you know, in the case of illness, you might say, all right, well, usually illness is related to killing karma and not being careful with life, or it's related to stealing karma, taking what hasn't been freely offered. There's a few different nuances and it's a big, huge topic, but you ask yourself, am I careful with life? When I'm cleaning and there's ants, do I go around them? Do I take them outside? Am I kind? Or do I just say, oh, well, and you wipe over them as if they're rubbish. You know, you're vacuuming, there's a spider up in, in the corners and you go, oh, I'll just zoom in up. You know, and I'm sure, you know, most of us are Buddhist and we don't do that, but maybe we did, maybe we did in the past. So those are things to purify so that you're not sick next time, right? So this is the way to approach it is it's anything negative happening to you. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. You can't attribute fault when there's so many conditions that came together for a behavior and a choice to happen. You can't say, I am bad, <laughs> but you can say all of those conditions came together here with this mental continuum. Therefore, this is the mental continuum that has to deal with them and cope with them. You know, but you're not bad. It just was a coming together. So I don't know if that made it more complicated or less complicated. Did that clarify? No, that, was, that was very helpful. It gave me some more context for it. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that karma section in the Lam Rim Chen Mo um, and the ethics section in the Lam Rim Chen Mo, those are really useful for just kind of looking at the details of why is this happening, you know, and then what do I do with it? So that's a really excellent section. Um, and uh, the next time you've got a program opening, ask, ask your teachers to teach on that because it's, uh, it's worth diving into. So let's um, just kind of keep going with the context so that we are all on the same page and then we'll do a little meditation. So this distinction, I think you're probably on top of. Now we're gonna look in terms of experience, just a, a really solid contrast, okay? So with the experience of love, how you can figure out, am I connecting with love or am I connected with attachment, is that love is calm, it's contented, and attachment is excited and restless. Attachment is excited, and I put it in quotes, because that excitement is actually anxiety. Okay, so just kind of look at those two and think in terms of your own experience mentally and physically. Love is calm and contented. Okay, when I'm really feeling a deep connection and love with someone, that peace, that deep peace you feel, and that kind of that background joy or forefront joy, but it's a joy that feels very even. Whereas attachment, you have this, I hope this doesn't end, or I hope I could add this, or I'm comparing it to that. And it's, it's kind of moving and restless. Do you agree in terms of experience? Can you feel that distinction in your mind when you've switched over from love into attachment? Attachment's very comparative. It wants to compare other moments of joy to this moment of joy and make it just as good or better or longer. You know, so you're with someone that you love and you're thinking, oh, five years ago when we went to the sea and we had that beautiful day, I hope that happens again. That thing that happened again with you, let's do that. You know, and you're sort of like, okay, this could really happen. This could come together because the last time I felt this way, it was with you. So let's make it happen. You know, and there's kind of a pressure and an anxiety of, I hope this happens. And we label it excitement, especially when we're teenagers, right? But even when we're adults, we label it as like, I'm excited. I'm really happy. I'm enthusiastic. It's attachment, man, because it's like a sugar high. And you're like, yay, crash. Yeah, and there's usually at the end of it is a letdown. There's a, that didn't turn out the way I wanted. Something's wrong with them, something's wrong with me, something's wrong with the C. One of the three or all three, but something is wrong. Because you gave all of the credit to some edited past memory that wasn't probably even as good as you remembered, you just extracted the unpleasant elements from your memory and added a soundtrack <laughs> and made the temperature just right, you know? So, so to remember that in the moment, if you're feeling that like bouncy, bouncy, bouncy happy, that is actually attachment. And it's semi-pleasant in the way a sugar high is semi-pleasant. But it's sort of like it burns out everything and then you crash. Whereas when you're having love, just deep connected love, there is no crash at the end. It might kind of wear off or you get distracted or you change activities, but there's not like a slump. Do you know what I mean? You're just like calmly contented and just like joyful in this kind of beaming way, but you're not jumping up and down inside. And the problem is, is that in our society, we're so conditioned to think that the jumping up and down inside feeling is the best part. And that's the part that should last and be sustainable. And if you've been married for 20 years and you don't feel butterflies in your stomach, there's something wrong. Rather than maybe you've matured and now you have an amazing relationship, but in the beginning when you were all butterflies and jumping up and down, you had all sorts of conflict and all sorts of arguments and it was passionate and it was exciting. But now, you know, 20 years later, you actually get each other and accept each other in a genuine expansive way. And now it's this beautiful, loving thing, you know, but from the outside society would say, oh, the spark is gone. What a shame, you know? So we're conditioned to believe the wrong thing. We're conditioned to think 
you have to be excited or else it's not real. Thoughts? Attachment mm -hmm. is a kind of hunger for excitement. You know, it keeps you hungry for excitement all the time. And it keeps you um, hungry for um, expectations that are need to be filled actually all the time. So the excitement, you know, it produces is, that's what's so attaching. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it, hunger is a good word for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also venerable. Yeah. Um, thank you for the teachings. I'm finding this so helpful in terms of discernment um, between attachment and love. What I also notice for myself is um, in addition to the excitement, it can vacillate to aversion. And yeah. I mean that in terms of recognizing that when that excitement isn't consistent, and like an addiction, it comes crashing into, um, you know, kind of noticing the lack of consistency. And then I can feel my, um, my heart breaking and all those questions. And, and then, you know, I can go into self doubt and isolation. And so that almost becomes like an existential angst. And the I is really coming face to face with that attachment yeah. to myself. And that's where, that kind of clues me in when my body starts to sink and my heart feels heavy that, whoa, I'm on the other side of this coin too. So it's sort of the, the restlessness and the anxiety of it and the excitement. And then also that, that, um, that aversion place too, which is, you know, a part of the attachment as well that, takes me into kind of wanting to separate and withdraw from it because I'm hurt, you know? Yep, and, and, and that's a key point. That's such a key point of the relationship between attachment and anger. It's it's so important to see that. My my teacher speaks um, not fantastic English and, um, and he will say in English, when attachment going, then anger coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, attachment going anger coming which you know sounds so simplistic yeah. and you're like I'm an adult I have more nuanced experiences than that but really it is like that simple yeah that's really helpful I like that thank you uh, Maria did you have one to add oh I was just when when you were talking at the beginning I was thinking about uh, my husband and I that we met when we were in our 20s and we had all that butterflies and it was just explosive love and and, uh, and we did have a lot of conflict and, but with the years, you know, it's turned more into less attachment and more, you know, of a partnership. And I was just identifying with what you said that now it's so different. And now it's like, I actually, when something comes up or I'm doing something, I ask myself, is this not every time, of course I'm trying, but is this for me <laughs> or is this because I want him to be happy? And it's really interesting because sometimes you also feel the pool like, well, what about me? I, I need this yeah. right now. Like, love aside for now. <laughs> There's some attachment, but, you know, it's just, um, you know, it's, you know, just develops into something else. And it's, it's just, uh, there's more um, happiness now and just, you know, it just feels better than what it was before, you know, when, when we met many years ago, 25 years ago. <laughs> For, for sure. And like a solid marriage like that can become part of your spiritual path or, you know, even a real pivot point or touchstone for your spiritual path. It's not like you can't have a romantic relationship and be working on the path to enlightenment. It, it is, as you say, it's like you realize the stuff in the beginning, which is all the stuff of, of movies and whatever, um, that is ephemeral and it's inconsistent and it's volatile. And it was sort of entertaining at the time, but spiritual maturity is trying not to like get yourself into those drama spirals now that you're all grown up. <laughs> you know, it's like you can even have fond memories of how silly you were then and how cute it was. And there was real fun and excitement and there was real like angst and horrible fights and just, uh. but now it's like, as you said, you're, it's a partnership. And that really ties into 
what are the agreements of love when you're in some sort of connection with people? You know, for me, it would be, what are the agreements I have with the nuns community or what are the agreements I have with my Sangha in terms of what do we owe each other because we're in some sort of ongoing connection? And do we owe each other anything in terms of expectation? Of course not. But if you're only giving and never feeling like you receive, that's tricky, but also kind of the bodhisattva path, but also kind of a slippery slope to martyrdom. And it's all kind of delicate, isn't it? And it has to be navigated very individually. And the only way to do that is to know yourself when you're in attachment so that you can catch it and diffuse it. And um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to look at those kind of solid marriages that have that sustainable thing where you see that is a good team, you know, that is a good team and they're helping each other on their path, as opposed to, you know, a couple that feels like, ooh, that's a bit stagnant or that's gotten into some unfortunate patterns, maybe call it a day, <laughs> you know, yeah. I said we almost called it a day, but we grew up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Venerable, may I ask yeah. you um, something you actually said, like almost at the beginning of this talk, which was, you know, the possibility of having a mindset where you can be detached, but not disengaged. And I've always struggled with that. Like, so I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, it's, it's hard for all of us. I think, what is that line? Because I think a danger for someone with a Buddhist worldview is that you so pursue a, a detachment that you kind of can become a bit disassociated or a bit dismissive, right? And so by disassociated, I mean, you're just kind of like half present, half indifferent, half not caring while you're living your life and you're living this kind of half life because you're trying to be detached. And that's not what detachment is, but it seems close enough and what a good Buddhist should do. So you're just kind of like a little bit not in your life because you're trying not to get triggered and you're trying not to have negative states of mind. So you're kind of not there. <laughs> and that's one danger. And the other danger is you become kind of dismissive of other people's emotions because yours are starting to get more under control because you've had access to tools to help you control them. And so you're not upset about something, but say your partner or your family is not Buddhist or they don't have a spiritual path or whatever, and they're really upset about something that you're kind of like okay with, you know, something unrelated, like the neighbors are, I don't know, always moving your garbage can to the wrong side or something like no one cares, but it really bothers your partner. And a Buddhist danger is to say, oh, you're so silly. Why are you letting that get to you? You know, that doesn't bother me at all. I don't know why it gets to you. And you're kind of dismissive under the heading of being detached. And, you know, the real path is to be detached while not being disengaged, where you're saying, I am not suffering, which is very fortunate because that means I have more space to hold you in your suffering. And you're suffering, whether I understand or not or relate or not, you're suffering. I'm here for you. And that's being fully engaged while being detached. You know, being detached really means that you're not believing your own escalated negative emotions. You're not believing them. You can feel them. You can notice them. You're not suppressing them. But when you're angry and your anger is saying, say these angry words or do this critical thing, you're saying, I don't believe you. That's not effective. I've seen that historically in my own past. And to be detached from attachment doesn't mean you don't, don't have attachment. It means you're not believing the hype that attachment says. You know, if your friend is coming from overseas and you're so excited at the airport and you've got your balloons and your flowers and yay, they're coming, they're coming. And then in your heart you go, okay, just be cool because they're coming from a long overseas trip and they're tired and exhausted and they might be kind of grumpy when they arrive and then feel like they need to put on a show for you, you know, or whatever, you know. So you're trying to have the big picture mind that says, I'm a little bit too amped up here. I'm acknowledging that and I'm trying not to act from that place or fuel it so that it increases in duration, yeah. So being detached means you're fully aware of what's going on for you 
and not letting negative states of mind dictate your behavior. So it's like you're all the way leaned in. I, the example I, I always use is if you're watching a movie sucked in or watching a movie with um, objectivity. So if you're watching a movie and you're sucked into it, then if there's an explosion or a tragedy, your emotions are as big as if it was real life almost. You know, if you've watched one of those movies and you're just like sobbing and sobbing. And to watch it with a little bit of distance, you could say, oh my gosh, that's so poignant. Wow, you know, but you're not hooked. And if someone interrupted you in the middle of the movie, you could be interrupted without being grumpy. And that's kind of a good litmus test is, is my emotion taken over so much that if I were interrupted, I would behave badly. <laughs> yeah. And if you were interrupted and you would behave badly, then you know you've gotten hooked into a negative state of mind. That's a, that's a good litmus test. Yeah, really with any activity, if you've gotten attached to the activity or attached to the person or the idea, could you be interrupted without rage? <laughs> if so, you're doing okay. If not, shake your head clear of it and, you know, detach. So, I mean, you see how vital self-awareness is with this stuff because intellectually, this is not hard, but experientially, you're just like, okay, but for me, what does it look like? Okay. Oh yeah, a certain kind of computer task. If someone interrupts me in the middle, I am grumpy as. Other kinds I'm like, oh, I wish I wasn't interrupted and I need to be assertive about my boundaries, but I'm not mad. <laughs> you know, there's kind of two different ways you react. All right, so experientially then, unpacking it further, we get love is also steady and consistent. Attachment is temperamental. And we kind of already touched on that. So then we get into then, you know, having no expectations versus many expectations. So love is not having a business deal mentality. Attachment is kind of a business deal. You're saying, I will be very, very nice to you if you're very, very nice to me. Love is saying the purpose of my life is to help sentient beings have happiness, whether they behave in ways that are conditions for my karmic seeds to ripen as happiness, it's not their job. Yeah, so this is, this is a little bit of a paradox because you're saying in your head, I have responsibility for all sentient beings happiness, but they don't have any responsibility for mine. It's like a paradox and it's a trap if you think about it the wrong way. Okay, so I have responsibility for the happiness of all sentient beings, what does that mean? It means watch your own mind, yeah? Watch your own mind so that you can be developing your path to enlightenment because the greater your own qualities are, the greater your radius of positive impact on other people in terms of being a condition for them. You're not a cause for them, just like they're not a cause for you. You know, you're not planting seeds in them, you're watering seeds in them. And that distinction is subtle, but it's important because if you think you're responsible for all sentient beings in a pressurized way, in the way we normally think of responsibility, then it's like you're carrying a bag of rocks of all sentient beings, trying to like haul them to enlightenment, kicking and screaming. You know, and you're like, come on, let's get to enlightenment. And it's like this horrible, exhausting thing. When in fact, it's, it's a light, joyful thing that kind of bolsters your own path when you think every moment of my development, every time I integrate a quality more deeply, that has a direct impact on how effective and beneficial I am to the minds of others. So that also feeds back into more positive karmic seeds for me and more happiness for me. Working for them is what gives me happiness. But you see how delicate it can be and how easy it would be to fall into the trap of saying, no, no, all the happiness for you, none for me. No, it's fine, I'm fine. You know, you could get really weird about this if you're thinking about it the wrong way. But do you know what I mean, this distinction? I have responsibility for all sentient beings. I have responsibility for their happiness. I have responsibility for relieving them from suffering and they have no responsibility for me or mine. It's delicate, right? It's not something you would talk to people who don't have Buddhist context with because they would misunderstand. 
is anyone feel like they might be misunderstanding <laughs> or not quite hitting the right note? I have a question that, I mean, has anyone ever thought that that word responsibility may not be the right word in that context? Perhaps it should be something like, I have an effect on all sentient beings. My presence can assist, my presence can radiate and, and cause an, a, a, you know, and be, as you said, like, like um, uh, an effect, right? Versus like mm -hmm. responsible. Is responsible like a good word to use? I'm just thinking English language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a question I've had too. And, and I, I, you know, search around for a better word and then I wind up sounding new agey or pop psychology. And, but then if I say responsibility, it feels like this heavy burden. And I don't know that we have a perfect word, but if someone comes up with one, let's, let's workshop it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with you, it's one. tricky. Yeah, we could maybe create a new word. <laughs> you know what? Years ago, I heard somebody point out that the, the, the roots of the word responsibility is literally the ability to respond. Mm. And I find that helpful. What like, because what we think of as responsibility being a burden, uh, I don't think that's part of the dictionary definition. That's just a cultural thing. So I try to remind myself, okay, I am able to respond. It's like if somebody yells fire and you see a fire extinguisher, you are able to do something about it. But that doesn't mean that if you don't, you know, you're, um, <laughs> you know, you're an asshole. Yeah, yeah. If your responses are limited, it's not yeah. like you're bad. Yeah. If there's no extinguisher there, it's not like it's your responsibility to throw your body on it or something and like die for the people, although you might decide to. Oh, right. <laughs> the response. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a good, that's a good reframe, or I guess not even a reframe. It's a good going back to the original going back to the original. Yeah, our yeah. connotations of words are so tricky. Oh yeah. And I mean, even the words love and attachment, that's why I started with the dictionary definition. It's just, they're so loaded. They're such loaded words. And then of course, in other languages, sometimes they have more words for them, sometimes less, you know, it's, it's complex. And so we have to touch the experience so we don't get thrown by whatever words are used. I think, um, Probably a lot of you have looked at old Buddhist texts that were translated into English maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And some of their word choices are really unfortunate, but it was kind of like the best they could find at the time. Like they used sin instead of negative state of mind. And you're like, oh gosh, this reminds me of something that wasn't nice, you know? But it was just the word they picked because it was kind of close. So if you know the deep meaning of these ideas in Buddhism, you're not thrown by any vocabulary. But when you are thrown by vocabulary, absolutely ask and unpack it. It's so important. So I think just touch, okay, what is responsibility in terms of, I guess, what is a word that connotes being lifted by a sense of the greater good as, as opposed to being oppressed by some chore you have to do? You want to feel lifted by wanting to work for the welfare of all sentient beings. Lifted that you have purpose, you have connection, you have meaning in your life because of this worldview and how wonderful it is to have a, a worldview that is buoyant and lifts you. So many people are just trying to get through the day and we can fall back into that ourselves very easily. But as soon as we lift into the greater good, and our work within the greater good, we're immediately happier. Yeah, it, it shakes off some of our little minor daily irritations. It kind of clarifies your vision. Do you know that feeling like when you've just kind of, you're just thinking about your stuff and your day and your stressors and you're just kind of like, Ugh. and then you remember the purpose of your life is to work for the welfare of all sentient things. And at first you're like, but what about me? And then you kind of, Whew, yeah, no, that's, that's not it. And you kind of lift back into however far you've touched bodhicitta so far, and it winds up being a great relief. Do you have some feeling of that, of like having kind of like at first, like, no, I don't want to, what about me? But it just opening out, you start to actually feel much better yourself. The problem is expectation. 
you know, and that's why it's on the chart, right, is that attachment will take the hopes or the plans of love, the aspirations of love, and caffeinate them. <laughs> yeah, it will say, okay, I want all sentient beings to have happiness. Good. Yes, wanting them to have happiness. Then attachment says, want, they must, they need, I'm in charge of that. If I don't, I fail, they're bad, I'm bad, something's bad, bah! You know, it caffeinates it or it like amps it up in some way. So wanting all sentient beings to have happiness doesn't mean that you're like suddenly in everybody's business trying to like work out their daily troubles. You know, like, oh, my neighbors aren't good at doing their taxes. I'll help them with that. Oh, these neighbors need help with this. I'll help them with that. Oh, these friends are having relationship problems. I'll be a counselor for them. You know, you're not like all in everybody's business suddenly. Out all their little daily stresses. You know, you're not getting, you're not becoming a busybody, right? That's, but attachment could say, if I'm working for the welfare of all sentient beings, I have to fix everything and I'm the savior of the world. You know this feeling, right? Like now I have to fix everything. And oh, I'm working for the welfare of all sentient beings. So I have to answer all the emails today in this moment because attachment gives you an illusion of urgency. It gives you a pressure of, I must act now or else I'm bad or they'll think I'm bad. So just wanting sentient beings to have happiness is really expansive and really flexible and if it's your kind of underlying worldview, then your own responses within that space adjust to what makes sense at the time. Attachment over plans. It says, I wanna work for the welfare of all sentient beings. So then the next time I see this person, I'm gonna say this, this, and this. And the next time I do this, I'm gonna manage it this way. And it gets really uptight and it gets really, um, yeah, it's yeah, uptight is the word because you're planning and over planning and trying to control things that you don't have total control over. And that's why we have so much anxiety, I think, is that we're trying to control things that we don't have control over. What we do have some control over is our own mental state. We don't have total control over our own mental state, but we have a lot more control over it than anything else. And when we apply that control to our own mental state, what happens is connection with the deep calm, the deep peace, the deep spaciousness of our mind. And from that place, you're creative. In that, from that place, you're flexible. Yeah, and from that place, everything you already know about life and relationships and communication is accessible to you. And you can use it in real time applied to the situation in front of you, rather than, you know, a few minutes before over planning, I'll say this, 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 and this, and you're really tight about it. But now the situation's in front of you and it doesn't make sense to respond that way. So it doesn't mean you can't have plans, but you're having them really loosely and flexibly. You know, the plan might be, it's probably best if I'm assertive in the next staff meeting because the last time I was a bit too passive and this and this difficulty happened because of it. Next meeting, I'll try and be a bit more assertive. And then you're ready and you're assertive, but you're not like getting ready for battle, <laughs> you know? And so you'll go into the staff meeting holding a quiet assertive space and you're watching your coworkers and you notice actually this one coworker is having a really hard time and they need to talk about a lot of things Maybe today's my not my assertive day. Today's my listening day. And, you know, the next time that issue that made me think that way comes up, then I'll respond that way. But if you went in over planned and like ready for war, you wouldn't even notice that this co other coworker is having a hard time and actually needs the room and space to help problem solve. You just be going in guns blazing. Here are my needs, <laughs> you know. So this is the thing we wanna remember is that we have many tools already, but they're not accessible to us because our mind is too busy and too chatting. You know, it's just So if we can kind of come back to contented, still loving motivation that's expansive, then we can be really creative and flexible in the moment. Is it making sense? So then you're not having expectations, you're having plans held lightly. Yeah. And the deep plan is, I want to be of benefit to all sentient beings. So it's just a heart centered goodwill. 
You know, it's just goodwill, really coming back to goodwill to your good heart and that all sentient beings includes you. You don't leave yourself out of all sentient beings, you know, but steady then. So any, any questions about that little list or things that you wanted to add to it? That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Clear, clear, just hard, clear, but hard. 